Commissioner Morris, Commissioner O'Doherty, Commissioner Schroeder, Commissioner Altman. Here. Commissioner Grath. Here. Commissioner Manley. Here. Commissioner Sharp. All right, thank you for that. Um, at this time, I'll entertain a motion for the approval and or correction of the minutes from our June 9, 2020 meeting. Do I have a motion? I make a motion if there's no uh, changes or amendments to the meeting. I'll okay, second. Second move. Al Tacone. It's been moved by Commissioner Schroeder, seconded by Commissioner Tacone. Uh, I'll call for the question. Um, all those in favor for the adoption of our June 9, 2020 minutes, please indicate by the usual sign. Aye. 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 Those opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, do we have any uh, off agenda items today? No. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda, item on the agenda is to welcome our newest commissioner, uh, Ms. Gina Sharp. Gina, welcome. Sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I understand you've got some folks in council chambers that I'm certain they've given you the appropriate welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Fantastic. Um, all right. So on to our business today. First item on our agenda, uh, business agenda, is the general plan update. Is Russ in the room? He is. Chair Matthews, commissioners, good afternoon. I'm Russ Cunningham with the city's planning division. You may remember that in the spring of 2019, we discussed the first phase of the city's general plan update, which involved the introduction of two new general plan elements addressing economic development and energy and climate action, along with the city's first climate action plan. That discussion, which was over a year and a half ago, um, focused on the themes that emerged in the course of technical study and public outreach in support of the economic development element and the energy and climate action element. I'm being asked to ask those joining us remotely to please mute your microphones if you're not speaking. Thank you, that's better. So as I said, our last discussion a year and a half ago was focused on the themes that emerged in the course of our technical study and uh, public outreach in support of the first phase of the project. So those themes you may recall for the economic development element or EDE as I'll refer to it in this presentation were quality of life, prosperity, collaboration, and resilience. So when we talk about quality of life, we emphasize the fact that economic development is not something that is essentially an end in and of itself. It's something that we pursue to enhance the quality of life of our residents. In terms of prosperity, our focus here has been on uh, increasing business activity in the city, um, providing more jobs, higher wages, more tax revenue, and more overall investment in the city. Collaboration was really a response to um, the less than positive uh, results the city has achieved in competing with uh, neighboring jurisdictions um, and other entities. So when we talk about collaboration, we're talking about coordinating with neighboring cities and other agencies in the region to really leverage our collective resources and pursue mutually beneficial outcomes. And then finally, resilience is focused on an economy uh, that is built for um, the long term, uh, an economy that can weather ups and downs. So we're talking about a diverse economy that doesn't have all of its economic eggs in one basket. Uh, we're talking about a workforce um, that is capable and ready 
um, and adaptable. And we're talking about um, adapting um, to climate change and the impacts and being mindful of the potential impacts that climate change might have on uh, our business um, community and on commerce um, in general. The Energy and Climate Action Element, or ECAE, um, had um, more themes, themes that are a little bit more straightforward. I'm not going to focus um, on these, um, but I am going to emphasize that all of these themes uh, are providing direction as we move forward with the second phase of the general plan update. I will also mention that these themes that organize the ECAE are essentially implemented through, uh, among other things, specific emissions reduction strategies that are outlined in the Climate Action Plan. So the EDE, the ECAE, and the Climate Action Plan were adopted by the Council in May of last year. We have since been pursuing implementation of these planning documents while initiating the second phase of the general plan update, and I'll tell you a little bit about that second phase. To be perfectly candid, um, implementation has been challenging um, given limited staff resources, the need to coordinate across city departments and disciplines, and of course the disruption created by the pandemic. Nevertheless, uh, we have, I believe, successfully integrated uh, the goals and policies of the EDE, the ECAE, and the strategies of the Climate Action Plan into our development review process. I think that uh, this first phase has really enhanced coordination between the Planning Division and the Economic Development Div Division. Uh, and I want to thank um, our Economic Development Manager um, for that excellent um, uh, coordination. Uh, we have recently adopted ordinances that implement components of the Climate Action Plan and that help to reduce the carbon footprint of new development, but doing so in a way that is uh, financially feasible um, and uh, responsible, uh, and that by and large provides a positive return on investment for businesses that are subject to these requirements that relate to renewable energy, electric vehicle charging facilities, urban forestry, uh, and transportation demand management. And I'm happy to, to talk about the details of any of those ordinances should you be interested. Another component of the Climate Action Plan is the Climate Action Plan Consistency Checklist, which is a way for the development community to streamline the environmental review process by um, implementing um, certain project features that allows us to waive project-specific assessment of greenhouse gas emissions. So we are hoping that this helps to um, incent um, additional development, um, provide uh, a level of certainty and transparency to the development community as far as the development review process is concerned. So moving on to the next phase, it is very um, ambitious. It is very multifaceted. Uh, in addition to updating the city's existing general plan elements, some of which date back to the mid-1970s, this second phase involves two focused planning efforts uh, that are essentially precursors to the updating of the general plan itself. And the first of those is the South Morrow Hills Community Plan, which will build on our efforts to promote agritourism in South Morrow Hills. Uh, it is essentially a response to the development pressure that the South Morrow Hills area um, is facing and has faced for a number of years. This is an effort to preserve farmland and aesthetic resources and ensuring that new development is uh, not in harm's way. This is obviously on the wildland interface where we have um, concerns about fire, potential fire impacts. So being mindful of that, while at the same time looking for opportunities to expand our housing stock in the South Morrow Hills area. The Smart and Sustainable Corridors specific plan seeks to channel growth into the city's already urbanized areas, primarily into our major commercial corridors. 
We hope that with this plan, we will establish a common understanding and expectation as to where growth will primarily occur um, in uh, the near future or over the next uh, planning horizon of the next 15 to 20 years. And then turning to the specific elements that will be updated, of these seven elements listed here, um, six of them are mandated by the state of California. Land use is a state mandated topic. In addressing land use, we'll be looking to really distinguish those areas uh, that are expected to experience growth and change from those areas of the city where we seek to essentially preserve and enhance existing character. One of the key challenges I think we face in updating the land use element is finding that right balance between our commercial land inventory and our industrial land inventory. You may remember a year and a half ago, we talked about the fact that according to uh, studies prepared by uh, Kaiser Marston Associates, we have a surplus of commercial land and commercial floor area, and we have a significant deficit of industrial land, um, judging from um, anticipated demand. So getting at that, I think, is going to be one of the key challenges and hopefully one of the key successes and accomplishments of the land use element update. The mobility update, I'm sorry, the mobility update um, will focus on the fact that we have a roadway network that is essentially built out. Uh, while there may be some opportunities for roadway expansion, we are not going to build ourselves out of congestion. So we need to look for ways to reduce VMT or vehicle miles traveled, ways to promote uh, other means of mobility, other means of transportation, and that will be a key focus of the mo mobility element. The housing element is unique in that it is the only general plan element that is required to be updated on a prescribed schedule. And fortunately, that schedule generally coincides with our schedule for the overall uh, general plan update. So we are expected to submit to California Housing and Community Development in April of next year an adopted housing element that primarily demonstrates this, that the city can meet its regional obligation as established through the regional housing needs assessment to demonstrate that we have the land resources to accommodate upwards of 5,500 new dwelling units, roughly half of which are expected to be affordable to lower income households uh, essentially over the next eight years. The next housing cycle, known as the sixth housing cycle, begins in 2021, extends to 2029. Community facilities, I think, speaks for itself uh, relatively well. This is the one optional element um, that we will be updating. It was last updated and it was prepared and has never been updated. It was prepared in 1990. Uh, so um, it's definitely time to uh, reassess needs uh, around City Hall, around the City Operations Center, uh, OFD, uh, facilities, OPD facilities, water and wastewater utilities, streets and other public right-of-way features. And these are the considerations that we'll be um, looking at um, as part of the community facilities element. Conservation open space, air and water quality, uh, natural habitat, farmland, visual resources, historic resources, recreational amenities. These are the things that we'll be addressing in the conservation and open space element. Those are two separate required state mandated topics that we are combining into a single element. Safety will focus on minimizing our risks to um, the, the risks that we face associated with natural hazards like wildfire, flooding, seismic activity, landslides, and uh, adapting um, to climate change and the impact that climate change will have on uh, our level of risk. And then finally, noise, um, identifying those sources of potentially excessive noise, sensitive receptors, uh, and looking for ways um, to mitigate, mitigate potential noise impacts. And obviously, uh, that's a quality of life issue uh, for residents. So we have thus far secured nearly a million dollars in grant funding. 
from the state of California. We've assembled what we think is a very, um, a very accomplished um, consultant team led by the firm Diet and Batia out of the Bay Area. We have been engaging staff in other disciplines to ensure that we have coordination and we have buy-in from those other disciplines. We've initiated a variety of technical studies to really understand the lay of the land and um, to allow um, facts uh, and conditions on the ground to, to help develop um, goals and policies. And we have been reaching out to stakeholders um, in a variety of ways. So the focus right now is on the South Morrill Hills community plan. Uh, the city council expects to see some draft materials in November. And so we've conducted an online survey uh, on South Morrill Hills alternatives. That was citywide. Uh, we've conducted virtual interviews with South Morrill Hills stakeholders. And we've also revisited uh, prior outreach um, that Commissioner Gall um, and others in the room um, have been involved in uh, that unfolded over the course of a couple years and led to the agritourism uh, strategic plan and changes to our agricultural zoning standards to facilitate uh, agritourism uses. Uh, we have conducted an online survey on the city's 17 neighborhood planning areas, and we have uh, conducted now 13 and by Friday, it will be 15 panel discussions on a variety of topics. We've invited professionals and experts in a, in a wide range of fields to help us kind of lay the groundwork um, for ideas, alternatives, uh, and the kinds of questions that we want to ask the community as we extend our um, outreach to the, to the um, community um, at large, essentially. So um, I very much appreciate Ms. Geller's invitation to uh, engage with you on the second phase of the GPU because it's really encouraged me to think about how the organizing themes of the two elements adopted last year will manifest themselves in the next phase of this project and what new themes are likely to emerge as we move this project forward. So I think going forward, um, we will see quality of life and prosperity be um, key considerations with the South Moore Hills community plan. Um, collaboration is very much a feature of mobility these days. The need to coordinate with um, the regional transportation agency, SANDAG, the need to coordinate with adjacent jurisdictions um, is uh, more and more apparent uh, as um, 21st century uh, mobility um, technolo technologies and options uh, present themselves. And the safety element is all about resilience. It's all about adapting um, to changes that we're seeing and really being mindful of the kinds of um, um, events that we've seen over the course of the city's history with respect to, particularly with respect to flooding, riverine flooding and coastal flooding and doing what we can to protect um, all stakeholders uh, from those risks. Going forward, these are some of the themes that we think uh, will emerge. Um, balance. So in the South Morrill Hills neighborhood planning area, we're looking to balance the city's need for housing with the community's desire to preserve farmland uh, and enhance the viability of agriculture. In our major commercial corridors, we're looking to balance more intensive land use and higher profile development with the desire to maintain the integrity of nearby uh, residential areas. And citywide, we're looking to balance the need for housing with the need to expand job opportunities, the goal of preserving sensitive open space with the goal of providing new recreational amenities in open space areas. Some of you, I think, have been following the uh, Loma Alta Creek or Loma Alta Slough restoration project, and there's a push and pull there. We want to take the opportunity to implement uh, an additional trail in the slough, but we want to be mindful of what the potential impacts to, to the habitat and to really the, the primary um, focus and, and intent of that project might be in introducing um, or inviting more uh, traffic um, within that area. And as I mentioned before, um, we have to balance the need to expand our industrial uses and create more capacity for industrial use with the desire to create uh, more vibrant and inviting commercial 
uh, environments. Part of that effort to create more inviting uh, and vibrant commercial environments um, is the Smart and Sustainable Corridors specific plan. And I thought it would be um, helpful to show you the study area for that specific plan. We're looking at the Mission Avenue Highway 76 corridor, the Oceanside Boulevard corridor, which of course includes uh, the Sprinter stations, which are considered smart growth opportunity areas, and then portions of the Vista Way Highway 78 corridor as well. So this is primarily commercial zoning where we're looking to essentially uh, liberalize uh, commercial zoning standards to streamline the development review process and provide CEQA clearance through a programmatic EIR. We want to identify infrastructure needs in these corridors and prioritize um, um, capital improvement projects that will um, incent um, redevelopment and infill. Uh, we want to complete our streets and green our streets um, in these areas. And we will likely leverage some of the ideas that came out of the um, Coast Highway Corridor Study and the Coast Highway Incentive District. And I'm, I'd be happy to speak to um, the lessons that we think we learned through that process and how we might apply those lessons um, as part of this project here. So finally, uh, well, next steps for us are focused on outreach. I'm sorry, it's just, I'm just about, you I'm just about done, so I can, uh, I can take questions in, in maybe just a moment, if that's okay. Did someone have a comment or? Yeah, this is Tyrone. I just wanted him to go ahead and elaborate on what those findings were at this time rather than wait for it to be addressed in a question. And the, the question relates to the Coast Highway Incentive District? That's correct. Yeah, so the Incentive District um, implements form-based zoning standards, which we think will bring um, a degree of predictability, consistency to the development review process. It also, we felt, justified um, a more streamlined review process in that projects that um, previously required planning commission approval um, can now be approved um, at we, what we call the administrative level um, by the city planner. Um, now those projects can be, those, those decisions can be appealed to the next highest authority. So we have established some findings for appeals that, that might um, help to focus um, any objections that folks might have to administratively approved projects. Uh, I think most of you are aware of the public benefit zoning that says that um, applicants can um, be granted additional residential density above 43 dwelling units per acre and additional building height above 45 feet and four stories in exchange for public benefits that um, include public open space, public parking, and commercial floor area that exceeds the minimum FAR. Another key component of the incentive district is the subdistricts within the corridor. So we have the nodal areas. Those are near our transportation amenities, the uh, Oceanside Transit Center and the Coast Highway Sprinter Station, where we want to see the most um, intense high profile land use. We want to see an appropriate mix of commercial and residential to create those synergies between those two types of uses. And then based on what we've learned from the economists, um, we believe that allowing standalone residential in other portions of the corridor, and those are the avenue segments, um, will help to bring more market, essentially more market demand uh, for commercial uses within the corridor, more rooftops, more demand um, for commercial goods and services in the corridor. So um, we do, um, I believe, have the maps um, for the incentive district on our planning division webpage. And I encourage you to take a look at those to see where the nodal areas are located vis-a-vis -vis, um, the avenue segments. So we're looking to bring some of these same principles to the uh, smart and sustainable um, corridors plan and essentially replicate some of these features uh, in the east-west corridors, recognizing that not all the corridors are the same. So we don't wanna treat them 
um, monolithically. We recognize that there are differences and, and we want to be sensitive to that and customize um, the, the plan to address um, those unique features. So uh, quickly, next steps, uh, we will uh, conduct uh, some property owner forums and I have a um, postcard flyer that I'd like to get in each of your hands today uh, that announces uh, these property owner forums happening later this month uh, in support of the Smart and Sustainable Corridors Plan. We'll have three forums, one on each of those three corridors that you saw on the map. I would really appreciate anything you can do to help us get the word out to property owners on these forums and encouraging them to contact me to RSVP. We will hold a city council workshop on draft materials related to the South Memorial Hills Community Plan in November. I will be holding virtual office hours on the city's neighborhood planning areas. Did anybody here happen to take the survey, the online survey on our neighborhood planning areas? It's still open, so if you go to our project webpage, um, you can still take that survey. And a follow-up to that will be these virtual office hours. Uh, we will be conducting an online survey on fundamental community values and core principles that the community thinks need to be embedded um, in the overall planning effort. And we will ultimately, perhaps not before the end of the year, but soon thereafter, be conducting some community workshops that basically bundle these topics in, in this way, land use, mobility, and noise, housing as a, as a separate topic, and community facilities, conservation, and open space, and safety being addressed um, in a third workshop. So um, that concludes my comments. I, I look forward to your questions. Okay, any questions for Russ? Commissioner Schroeder? I, oh, okay, I thought, uh, real quick, I just wanted to say I'm really glad to see that you're addressing the industrial uh, relocation and renovation of a lot of these areas. They become, I don't wanna say tired, but they, they need to be sort of repositioned as, as their, the buildings are aging on them because the industrial is changing also in the sense of uh, the computers, the everything that's, in, that's computerized and maybe less labor intensive, but it's labor overall to engineer them. So I think that's great because we do have the areas that can be attracting a lot of these. Um, I was glad to see that the housing, you're looking at not only vertical, but the horizontal on that because as we're running out of land, there's only so much of it. So that as we take a look, one of the things that in the past we found through the economic development was in attracting some of the major um, companies into the area. We had several that we were competing with and unfortunately we lost because we didn't have the executive housing. So in that component, maybe something to throw in there that, because uh, I know we had several large companies that um, ultimately located uh, in some of our competing communities and it was the fact because not the fact that we weren't on the beach, we had the museum and the, the museums and things like that. It was the, the housing component. So in that housing component, I guess I wanna say a quality executive, not a lot, but something to maybe be addressed to be, attract that. Um, the other thing I was thinking about was the mobility. Um, I know that's a difficult thing to discuss. We, for the longest time, we have uh, had relied on the Sprinter being uh, something that was going to attract a lot of um, ridership and unfortunately it hasn't been to the fruition that everybody anticipated on it with the tremendous investment on it. So I think it's something to look at. It's you can get from one point to the other but the speed is too slow and then once you get off of it you can't get anywhere. And that's been the problem for a lot of it. Um, I overlook it, I see it all the time and it runs empty all the time and I think we're all caught as we travel up and down the, the different streets up and down Oceanside Boulevard and College and some of the others where El Camino, Oceanside Boulevard and Rancho Del Oro where we're caught in the, the backup traffic. So you're worried about the greenhouse gases, but I don't think they took into effect when they designed it. They made them crossings instead of under crossings, over crossings. So we've got an awful lot of people who are trapped backing up. And I think it's something that you hear all the time of the greenhouse gases. I think it's something we need to take a look in the future for your, um, the design of this, this mobility. And one thing I just wanted to throw into it too, it's, I know it's, it's, it's an individual item, but I think once we get a lot of these things going, we need to be able to maintain the streets. And I think it's something we haven't done a lot within the city. We've, it's been sort of a secondary thing. 
But as a business is coming into town looking, that's a vital part of just the maintenance of the appearance of the city, the entrances the, and everything. We've, we've worked on it some in the past, but the maintenance has lagged in some of the areas on this. And that's a very important aspect of appearance. You have, uh, as, as these companies come in, which are gonna be creating jobs, creating businesses, taxes for the city, it's all another component of it. So just something to throw into the mix on it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Just a quick uh, response sure. uh, regarding the Sprinter. Sure. Um, planning has been involved uh, in a uh, task force effort um, that um, is sponsored and managed by uh, the transit district to look at the relationship between transit and land use. And so NCTD is making a, a, a really concerted effort to understand how each of the cities in the Sprinter corridor um, are, are planning for, for growth, where that growth is likely to occur, what the nature of it will be. So we think there's a land use component to Sprinter um, viability. The other factor is um, completing um, the amount of double tracking that they need to complete to, to increase the headways and get to 15 minute headways at some point so people don't have to schedule their Sprinter, uh, Sprinter travel. They can show up and know that there's a train coming within 15 minutes. Um, it's pretty good. I think there's most. about 96 train. I think there's about 96 different trains a day going back and forth on it is what there was for quite a while on it. But there, within the exception is the morning hours and maybe late afternoon. Most of the time, unfortunately, the, the trains are just empty to just one or two. It doesn't even pay for the the upkeep and the the, the people that are actually driving the, the facility, the, the, the item. So it's the, somehow there has to be a way to either attract it or pick it up and move it somewhere where it can be betterly, better used or something on it. Yeah, and, and, I, and you made the point that uh, it doesn't necessarily go where people need to go. So right. maybe right. Um, as each city and, and continues the, the to the time grow, to get there when you, you can drive it in 20 minutes or 30 right. minutes, but from right. Oceanside yeah. to Escondido is an hour, no matter how you look at it. And if you're commuting from Oceanside to San Diego, you have another 45 or 50 minutes. So you're at the point where you're looking at a two hour commute. So they're, they're going alternately back to the car or vans or something like that, so. Thank you. Mr. Morris. Any press? Me. Russ, thank you very much. We appreciate it. We got one more question here. Um, right. my, my question is basically, you're doing a great job going east-west, but how about north-south on like El Camino and College, you could say Rancho Del Oro, um, those, those areas that are going north and south? That question has come up recently, Commissioner, and it's, it's an excellent question. And I think we're gonna have to consider to what extent we can incorporate um, e either into the corridors plan or into the land use element, the updating land use element, considerations for those north-south corridors because they are, they are a key part, um, obviously, of our uh, roadway grid. And um, also, I think, in many ways, um, equally ripe for infill and redevelopment. Appreciate that question. Okay, and I have one comment based on Jim's um, observation. Um, I rode um, Amtrak and Coaster or Metrolink for probably 20 years of my working career to downtown LA or to downtown San Diego. And the biggest frustration for a commuter is number one, the single track, because you have to be perfectly timed or you sit. Two would be the safety element, and that's, you know, people don't listen, they don't watch, they think they can outbeat the train. I would say once a month, our train would hit a person, unfortunately, okay? You know, when you're going from here to LA, that's, you know, 98 miles, so you, you know, once a month, once every two months, he would hit a person and we would be delayed for three, four, five hours. I know that's nothing like the person being dead, but we gotta think about that because one of these days, you're gonna see it right down here. We need to think about putting the tracks below grade or something like that on the major intersections. And then now, they, now with COVID, and I go to New York all the time and I used to run, ride the subway, which was disgusting, by the way, we need to make sure they're clean. Okay, because they're just, you know, the, the, if you want to get ridership, those are the three things you can do 
to, to get people to go back onto these trains. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. Yeah, thank Anything else for Russ? If not, thank you, Russ. Thank you. Okay, is Jeff in the room? He is. Great. Hello, Jeff. Good afternoon, Chairman and Commissioners. This item involves a uh, review of significant projects uh, pertaining to economic development that the planning division is currently working on. We don't include subdivisions and pure housing projects on this list, just to keep people up to speed on the economic development projects. The memo's uh, updated since the last memo back in June, since your August meeting was canceled. So I'm just gonna go over some of the more important uh, projects. These both include both uh, policy and actually development projects. So first of all, item uh, number one is a local coastal plan update and staff is waiting on coastal commission input regarding our draft coastal plan policies. These are land use policies very similar to what Russ was just talking about, except these are only germane to the coastal zone. We're also, staff is also um, researching potential revisions to our existing C wall ordinance, which is a major um, concern of the property owners and the Coastal Commission. As a generalization, the Coastal Commission does not like seawall hardening. If you read the news about other coastal communities, it's a, a big topic. Um, item number two and three, Russ already talked about, so I won't go into that. Item four, Russ mentioned as well, um, this is a Coast Highway Corridor Plan. It was adopted and we um, are waiting for certification by the Coastal Commission. The entire Coastal Highway Corridor is within the Coastal Zone, so we have to have certification before we can amendment. They wanted some additional information as they usually do. We've uh, provided that to them and now we are waiting for their review and um, hopefully certification, um, perhaps by the end of the year or maybe early uh, in next year. Item number five is the downtown zoning amendments. These um, were um, revising the zoning ordinance to remove the density cap, expand the TOD area for reduced parking, provide for tandem parking and inclusionary housing. Staff is waiting on the Coastal Commission to certify that. Again, we provided the additional information and we're hopeful that this will be um, certified in either December or early next. Item number six also involves the downtown commercial uh, zoning, but it, this was to expand the number of uses that are allowed. Early on, our downtown zoning was very restrictive, very prescriptive, and um, we took a fresh look at it, and we went to the council, and they expanded the number of commercial uses that are allowed. We are going to bundle this with some other zoning amendments and send those to the Coastal Commission for certification. We are only allowed so many coastal zone amendments in a year, so we have to bundle them together and then submit them. Going over to the next page, item number 11 at the top, the staff is currently working on a specific coastal zone amendment that would allow short-term rentals and perhaps even low-cost hotels within five miles to be counted towards our policy that requires us to maintain 375 low income rooms within the coastal zone. We have a bi-monthly meeting with coastal staff um, and last week was our October meeting and they seem to be amenable to this. So we'll see how that goes. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute regarding the uh, Marriott Residence Hotel. So development projects now, those were all policy projects, zoning, ordinance amendments, et cetera. Now the actual development projects, item number 12, the ends of Buena Vista Lagoon. This is three hotels, 426 rooms. A number of permits are required. The planning commission approved the city permits. We also need permits through Carlsbad. That's the next step. And then eventually we need a permit from the coastal commission. And the Planning Commission recommended approval on that Coastal Commission permit, but we don't have jurisdiction on that. Obviously, we don't have jurisdiction on the Carlsbad permits either. So we, we have a few more steps to go, but the Planning Commission approved the first steps 
um, in that. Number 14 is Rio Rockwell. This involves a, a zone change from commercial to residential. We're generally skeptical of those, or at least we scrutinize them. In this case, given that location, we believe that it is uh, not vi viable for commercial. It's at Old, Old Grove and Frazee. And so we are supporting that. That is scheduled to go to the Planning Commission on October 26. This involves 104 units. And it's currently scheduled for council review on November 4. Going down to item 18, the Alta Oceanside Mixed Use Project. This is at 939 Coast Highway, the uh, site of a, an adult business. This was approved on May 20th, however, and this involves 309 units, 26 affordable on site. Uh, council um, was very appreciative of that. 5,600 square feet of commercial. Um, this was approved on May 20th, but the Carpenters Association has filed a sequel lawsuit, so it's on hold. The Carpenters Association. There's a formal name, um, so th that's my own uh, description of that, that entity. Item number 21 is the arena out at El Corazon Park, the, the Califino Arena. This is a, up to 7,200 seats outdoor plazas, outdoor seating, large facility. The uh, development plan and conditional use permit are still under review and we're working with them on a joint parking agreement because there's um, issues on using, utilizing parking that is needed for other uses out there. Item number 22 is the Ocean Camp Mixed Use Project. This is at the prior drive-in theater. Very large, exciting project, 300 room hotel, retail, office, a surfing wave pool, fitness center, 700 residential units. This was on hold for a while. They had some internal team issues and they've resolved those and now it's um, being reactivated again. The next several items include a lot of medical cannabis items. I won't go through all of them, but I will mention item number 24, which is the Left Coast Medical Manufacturing Facility on Ord Way. That was approved by council on October 7th. So this is our second medical cannabis facility, the, the first one being a delivery business on San Luis Rey Road. The others are still going through the process. Going all the way down to item 33, Brother Benno's standing committee, the final meeting was postponed due to COVID. We have rescheduled it for November 12th. That's at 3 p.m. And this is where the standing committee will review draft revisions and new conditions of approval and recommend those to the full planning commission for their consideration. Item 34 is a Marriott residence in at North Coast Highway, the uh, roadway in flying bridge site, 117 rooms, meeting space and restaurant. This was approved by council over a year ago and staff has been working to submit additional information that was requested by the Coastal Commission regarding low cost visitor accommodations, encroachment and habitat, et cetera. This went ping pong back and forth several times. They asked for information, we gave it. They wanted more, they wanted it refined, they wanted it explained. Um, the biggest hurdle is that low cost visitor accommodations. Again, we have to maintain 375 per our coastal plan and they were concerned that um, by changing the roadway in, we would lose enough of those low cost rooms that we would no longer comply with our 375 requirement. So um, we are working on that as I mentioned earlier. Item 35 on the next page is the Sudbury Mixed Use out at El Corazon Park, 268 apartments, 4,000 square feet of commercial, and this is still under review as is Item 36, Mission Flats Mixed Use at Douglas in 76, 137 apartments, 4,000 square feet of commercial, and also historic design guidelines are applicable because this is so close to the mission. This is scheduled for Planning Commission review in two weeks, um, October 26. Item 37 is a Sunset Mixed Use Project. This was originally approved for 76 apartments back in May. They came back and expanded the project into the two adjacent parcels to the north. So now it's 118 apartments, 2,000 square feet of commercial, 4,300 square feet of amenities. And you'll see how we're starting to list amenities as well as commercial retail because it's so hard for the developers to commit to that much retail. So we're giving them flexibility. We're saying as long as it's not a residential appearance, you can use it for an amenity for the residences. It's not retail. 
But if the market ever does come to the point where that is suitable for retail, it's designed that way. High ceilings, tall windows, glass, doors out front, very small, if any, setback, et cetera. So they can use that for public amenity, private, private amenities, pardon me. Um, this was approved by the um, Council on September 9th. So this is the second go around the expanded version and that was approved in September. Item 38 is a coastal academy. Russ mentioned how our industrial zones are um, somewhat being competed over for other non-industrial uses. Here's an example. It's a nine acre private junior high and senior high. It would involve a slight zone amendment from general commercial, or pardon me, general industrial to limited industrial. This is under review. 39's a CarMax auto dealership out on Plaza Drive. This was reactivated after being on hold due to COVID. They said due to COVID, we don't know if we're gonna pursue this. And now recently we, we have been informed that they will continue to pursue that. Item 41, very big project. The NCTD request for proposals. They did reach an agreement with a development firm to redevelop the Oceanside Transit Center. It's 10 acre site, mixed use, so it'll have residential, office, commercial, transit oriented development. Obviously there'll be parking both for the new uses, the residents, and also for the transit center itself. It's a hodgepodge, a patchwork of zoning. It is split by the downtown and the coastal zone. And we are gonna to suggest to them that they come in with a mixed use plan or a specific plan to set up the zoning and the development standards for the entire site just for that project. And we uh, really will be encouraging them to do that. I think once they look at the zoning and, and start figuring it out, there won't be much of an argument. That's my opinion. I shouldn't give my opinion. <laughs> um, number 48, Western Sierra Law School. Again, another um, non-industrial use in our industrial zones. This is on Seagateway. The CUP is under review. 49 is getting a little bit of attention. This is the Starbucks drive through at 801 Coast Highway. It's a vacant site it, uh, just north of Neptune, and this is under review. There was some traffic concerns originally with that one, and traffic staff has worked with the applicant. The next category is development projects that staff has a approval authority for, and I won't go through them all. I'll mention a, a couple. 52 is a bed and breakfast on 708 Civic Center Drive. The administrative CUP is under review. Um, I guess I was really impressed with this project because I listed it twice. It's also listed at number 57. Um, so you can ignore the second one. Um, of, more note is uh, number 54, a sobering services center at 1919 Apple Street. This is a city sponsored project, the police are involved. And this is under review. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if we um, hear from the neighbors. Um, who wouldn't want a sobering center in your neighborhood at all? And finally, the last category is potential development projects. These, um, there's no application that has formally been submitted. Most of them have held a developers conference, but um, I, I guess maybe less than half of our devel developers conferences actually come to fruition with a formal application. So we're not always sure those are coming in, but they're in of interest. And with that, I'll entertain any questions if you have any. Any questions for Jack? Not a question, just a comment. I just, so for some of our newer commissioners, um, I'd just like to make it known that uh, a lot of, not a lot of these, but a number of these projects have been in the pipeline, if you want to call it that, or in the works, well over 10 to 12, 14 years in some of these. I mean, it just, it, it's a long, 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 long process. And they've stuck to it and they're trying to get to completion on it. So they've gone through cycles of business up and down and everything. But it's like our hotel project is 20 some years on that in the making. So it's, it's not an easy thing to go through with all of the loops and from the state, from the county, from the Coastal Commission to everything. One question I just had real quick on it, number 51, choose. I know I had gone to the one in Carlsbad for some time and when they left, they were looking at Oceanside. Have they, I see it's withdrawn the, this particular location down in the valley. Are they still looking in the area or did they just finally give up and move on? They were I haven't heard of another site um, under their um, research, but I can, I can ask my staff. I was just curious on that. They, they were a great facility and they, were, they had a small one of about 10,000. They were looking for about 35,000 square feet with pools. And I'm sure with the COVID, with most of the gyms shut down, it may have been a reason to withdraw out right now until a later time or something like that. Uh-huh. 
Any other? Well, let me follow up real quickly. Um, some of the projects that I didn't mention, there hasn't been a lot of progress. We generally try and keep projects moving along and active, and if we really don't hear anything from them, we'll give them warnings and, and we'll talk to them, but eventually we'll ask them to withdraw it. If we don't hear anything from them, we have the ability to actually just withdraw it withdraw it ourselves. It, we have to keep our permitting up to date. We don't want our accounts or our reports like this to be misleading. Um, during COVID, we've taken a, a very soft approach on that. So um, because of COVID, we haven't really been pushing people. If they've been a little lax and we haven't heard anything from them in a while, we've kind of let it go during COVID just to keep you folks informed. Okay. Just had one more comment. On number 41, the North County Transit, I think I read in the paper where they were looking at the same time to take their corporate headquarters which is what Ditmar and Mission Avenue, I think that block, and they were looking at turning into a, um, I, not a mid-market, but I, I think I, I referred to it as a lower income um, project on that. Are they, are they still anticipating doing that? Because that seems like an awful valuable piece of property on Mission Avenue to turn it into that, especially if you have families that are living in it, there's no place for kids or any recreation or whatever else on part of that. So I just was As I understand it, their proposal is to move the offices from that site to the redevelopment of the transit center and then pr put housing on that site. And I understand that affordable housing is one of the considerations. Um, as was mentioned earlier here, and I think it was even by you or somebody else, that one of the problems we have with companies is they, they, they don't have a housing for their employees. And so I think they're taking that into consideration. Okay. Um, Oceanside, when Michelle um, left as our city manager, she said Oceanside's evolved to the point where we're no longer just desperate for any development. We're running into problems that a successful city has, and you can look at our affordable housing, and we're starting to have an affordable housing problem in Oceanside. So, um, clearly not Del Mar or La Jolla, but we're getting there, and we're moving in that direction. I just was just kind of curious on that particular location for that particular product on it because it, it, it is in the center part of the city and there's not a lot of recreational for, if, if there are families, young families and stuff as part of that, not that they shouldn't be entitled to it, yeah. but just to, um, for something to think about. One other item is, and I didn't really mention it, but we did a time extension, we took a time extension ordinance. We wanted to revise that process where in the past it required a public hearing, which we didn't think was uh, an efficient use of time. Um, as part of that uh, amendment to the time extension requirements, we put in a one-year automatic COVID um, extension. So that's been applied across the board. Okay. Coincidentally, the state, the governor just uh, assigned, signed a bill that I believe ran at 18 months. Um, we have to take out our one year if we did one with COVID, but it could add another six months on top of this. So there are some actions as the city and state are taking to extend these time extensions uh, during COVID. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Any, uh, anybody else? Yes. Yeah, just, just one question. This is uh, Frank Greth here. Uh, hi, Jeff. Um, uh, number 22, the Ocean Camp, you say, indicate it's under review. Um, what are the next steps uh, with that under review, and when can we expect to see more activity going on there as far as uh, the next steps of construction? Well, they are working on their grading plan right now, and I believe they're getting close to having that completed, but that's just to level the site and get the pads ready. They, they still have to go through the review by the departments, including the wildlife agencies, because there's habitat involved. There's also um, the issue of the housing. Their initial application didn't identify very specifically the types of housing, and so we need additional information on that. So it's, un it's under review by the different departments and the uh, different agencies. Um, it's a complex project. I imagine it'll still be several months out, and then they have the uh, CEQA process on top of that. Great. Thanks for the update. Um, again, not to ed editorialize too much, there's a lot of excitement about this project. Um, um, I think the wave pool is, is kind of an attraction that people are excited about. There's talk that it would be an Olympic training center, perhaps. Um, so. Um, again, there's a lot of excitement about that project. Anybody else? For sure. Leslie, did I see your hand I up? I do, and yeah, I'll just go first really quick. Um, on the low-cost accommodations, just keep in mind that on any giving month, we have more room night supply available on the vacational side than the hotel side. So if those numbers are ever helpful to you, um, I can give those. They're definitely much, very much a part of the tourism industry and they pay TOT, they pay TMD, and there's a lot of room nights out there. 
and some, some months more so than hotel. And could you say the beginning again? We have a higher supply of? Some months in the marketplace, there's more room night supply from our vacation rental side than our hotel side. Okay. We have 60,000 room nights, generally speaking, available on hotels, and um, the vacation rental side often exceeds that. Thanks, that's good information. Uh, Scott Nightingale is the head of the uh, project to amend that um, policy to require the hotel rooms at 375. He may get a hold of you and ask for your input. Yeah, I'm happy to give him that data if it's helpful. So, and then um, it doesn't, I don't want to elaborate too much on Ocean Camp, but it doesn't look like it's changed too much from the original plan. I don't remember the numbers exactly, but it seems pretty similar. There weren't any significant changes. What happened, and I don't know all the details, but there was an investor um, that want, the, the main investor wanted to buy out the smaller investor, I guess is how I'd categorize it. That didn't really affect the proposal. Okay, so and I asked the same thing. It has it changed much? And Sergio, who's the project lead, said no, at this point it hasn't. Oh, thank you. Anybody else? Ward, did I see your hand up? Yeah. Um, could you give me <clears throat> an idea of what um, affordable housing in a beach community means? Well, there's the technical side of it, and the technical side of it is they categorize it by income. So first they take our area, area median income, and the area median income is based on different sizes that HUD produces this for every city. And ours, I believe, is in the uh, low 70,000s for a family of four. So then you have that as your baseline. Then you take a percentage of that, and for low income, it's 80% of that. For very low income, it's 50%. And then there's actually, in our community, there's a above um, low income. It's called um, workforce or moderate income, which goes up to 120% of your area median income. Um, when I was a kid, um, affordable housing was for people who couldn't keep a job and they were living out of their, um, you know, back then it was a, a station wagon. Um, affordable housing is, is, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's a real uh, issue in most communities, particularly coastal communities, I think most of my staff would qualify for workforce housing of 120% of AMI, mm -hmm. and a number of cities are grappling with that issue. So um, it's a long-winded question, but it's a complex, I mean, long-winded answer, but it's and a complex we issue. We have to provide, what did you, the number is the 375 units? Well, that's, that's, it's we in, have to provide 40%. zone. Russ mentioned the number, which is 5443. That's our new number, 5,443. Forty percent of that has to be affordable to lower income uh, households. In Eighty percent or low. Pardon me. In the coastal zone. In Oceanside, the entire city. Um, one of a couple other questions: the flagship on that Marriott Inn, where the Flying Bridge was, it's. A it's a Marriott now. No more residents in. No, no. It, they finally decided that the, the flag was going to be Marriott. Okay. No, I'm asking you. It, it's a Marriott residence. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. As I understand, it's a Marriott residence in. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Leslie might know more yeah, than I mean, me. It's a, yeah, it's a Marriott. That's it's what Dr. A, Patel told me. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Patel's project. All right. The gas station at Rancho Del Oro and Seagate, wh where is that? It's opposite the entrance to the senior center. Right. So it'd be on the east side. Like wh of where the VA is, it'd be right there? Um, I don't know it from that description. I'd call it right. south of the, of the uh, Marriott there. Gotcha. In, in that new development, is that what, there something new is going down on that corner down there? That, that is a different development down oh, okay. on the corner. That is a mixed-use project, formerly city-owned. Uh, that was the Arroyo Verde uh, project. So the mixed-use, um, I believe there's some residential and then there's some uh, commercial on the ground floor. Uh, item 54, uh, Apple Street, where is that? That is by Greenbrier. Greenbrier? Yeah. And again, on the north side of Apple is residential district. So we also have the Bread of Life in this area in the same building. And some of the neighbors over the years have said, why are all these types of services 
being concentrated in our neighborhood. And fortunately, the county has moved their yeah. facilities that were south of Oceanside Boulevard into the industrial park. So I think that re has relieved some of that concern. My last question, haha. Uh -huh. um, the uh, item 21, the arena at El Corazon. Give me a synopsis of what the deal with the parking is going to be. I and have not been involved with the uh, details of that agreement, um, but there's essentially the idea is there's joint use of the parking. So there's soccer fields, there's the aquatic center, senior center, there's this arena. Um, and so the idea being that rather than building parking for every use separately, some of the uses could do a joint share. And we do that commonly. We actually encourage it in our commercial areas so that we don't have too much parking. And so we just need to work out the details. Is, does the city derive any um, award from the parking revenue up there? I'm, I'm not, uh, I believe the city gets revenue from the parking, but I'm not sure, so I don't want to speak to that. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. You bet. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I, I'm sorry, I had a question. This is Matt. I'm on the phone. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, it's interesting to see, for example, Blade Restaurant talking about doing some investment on their property there on Seagaze. Just curious what the overall impression is of, in particular, restaurants, but also other businesses that are impacted by the COVID um, crisis we're in in the last six months. What kind of change in the overall, you know, retail landscape and just what, do you, what you guys are seeing in terms of that um, impact? What we saw initially was a hard hit on the restaurants when the early um, executive order closed them completely. Then as they started allowing them to operate outdoors, we worked um, with your economic development staff to come up with some um, business regulations that would allow them to operate outdoors. And I think that has really helped. Um, my concern is, and maybe it's a little overblown, I grew up in the Northwest and, and the idea of outdoor eating in winter is the oxymoron. Maybe in San Diego it'll work a little bit, but I think it's gotta, it's gotta um, have a dampening effect. And then, um, and this is just my opinion, we, we have briefings on COVID and from the health specialists, they're saying that with the flu season on top of COVID, um, I think it's gonna be hard for our restaurants. Um, I think it's gonna be a hard winter for the restaurants. Did I answer, you, did I answer yeah. your question? Yeah. Well, yeah, and I guess I'm just wondering if there's a lot of, you know, restaurant closures that you're seeing, or are they all just kind of hanging, and if, if there's new, any new things happening with those retail places, or if we would have to think about that, I guess, in the future, if you guys have had discussions about how to deal with some of the retail, if there's, you know, I don't know, if we're seeing a lot of retail empty storefronts, or if it's hanging on at this point, and we just have to see how it, how it all plays out over the next six months to a year. I, I don't believe we're seeing a lot of closures right now. Again, I think we might in the winter. Um, you, you raise a very good question yeah. about retail and commercial uses in our mixed use um, projects. And the developers have made it very clear that the retail, including restaurants, is very difficult, very challenging. And the planners don't want to see empty storefronts either. So um, as I alluded to in one of the earlier projects, we try and be very flexible with the uses that are allowed in there um, so that it's active and it's attractive and there's some energy and excitement, but it may not be open to the public. Um, in the future, if the commercial market realizes it, then it could be easily converted to um, commercial. It, it's, a, it's a very uh, challenging time for retail. Mm -hmm. And I think it was prior to COVID, I think it was because of the e-commerce. Um, I'm sure we're all aware of Mr. Bezos' uh, annual salary now. Um, and you put e-commerce and then you combine that with COVID and it's very challenging. Michelle, do you, you got any yeah, insight? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we've been tracking um, kind of informally. Patty's been doing a great job of, of 
anecdotally tracking businesses that have closed permanently. Um, we've tracked about 29. Um, those range from, you know, nail salons, pawn shop, um, let's see, some professional services. Um, but then we've got 31 businesses that either recently opened or are coming soon. Some of those in those same spaces that have vacated because they've closed permanently. So at this point, um, it appears that, you know, we are, we don't have a net loss of businesses that have permanently closed. But as Jeff mentioned, you know, we'll see as things progress. So that, you know, I, uh, everybody doesn't know I'm banking and um, on, on our on our restaurant book, uh, our restaurant book is 100 percent paying right now. Um, everybody has adapted. Our restaurant book is probably a little bit different than everybody else's. Our restaurant books are like these little storefronts. So they already had a lot of takeout. And so those, their takeout quadrupled. They all joined a DoorDash or whatever those are. And, and they're, they're, they're not doing great, but they are surviving and they're able to pay their loans. And that includes SBA loans and regular loans. We only have one fine dining sit-down restaurant, and it is really struggling. It is very much struggling. Um, on our hotel motels, that's our big area that's a problem. Our hotel motels, we have a huge hotel outside of, uh, I think it's called, uh, it's Newark Airport in, in New Jersey. It, luckily, the person's worth millions of dollars. It's doing but it is basically 5%, 10% occupancy. We have other hotels. Our smaller hotels seem to be doing okay and able to pay and so forth. Um, our, you know, our other commercials, like our, our biggest problem is the landlords for the mis mixed use areas. We have mixed use loans and those seem to be the biggest problems because we've had people just cancel their leases that have been office or whatever, why do I need to pay office space when I, everybody's working from home? So that's the other issue, er, other area of really, we see as a big concern is, is that. But again, we were not, our, again, this is LA, New York City, Chicago, not here, okay? But LA is somewhat here. Um, you know, our nail salons, those places that are in these, Retail strips, we have a lot of retail strips in LA, you know, like five, five little units. They're all paying now. They had a real tough time before the nail salons and the little, you know, the, the, the dry cleaner and all like that were all back open. So it's, in some areas it's bad, but other areas it's just, it's fine. I mean, residential, we, you know, we do, um, we, ha we, we service over 5,000 um, Fannie Mae loans. We only have 50 on deferment right now. Um, we have a book of our own. I don't know what our book is right at the moment, but our, our book, we started with over 500 deferments. We have about 5,000 loans also. 500 deferments starting in March. And today, we are down less than 100, but I don't know the exact number. So everything has gotten much better um, because things are opening up and, and, and so forth. And, and as time goes on, we just have to get more confidence. I mean, uh, in ourselves and, and in our communities and so forth. We're, we didn't fly for three, four months. We're now, we're now flying back and forth to New York and to Chicago like we were before COVID um, because you can get a test and get tested within a day and, and so forth. If we're doing that, other companies are beginning to do that too. So it's, it's a matter of time, matter of talking to our, I mean, there's, we do have to do something with the hotel motels because they're the ones that are really hurting and uh, the, airport the airport properties are devastated because there's no travel. There's no travel for business. We're probably, like I said, one of the first businesses to, to get people back out. I don't know, that type, my travel has been zero because that's what I used to go for. I used to go meet with investors and all. They don't want to see me anymore. 
but our managers are flying out to their other locations where they haven't been since March, and they're beginning to do that like they used to do. So that, that's, you know, gives you some flavor from statistics. I have to publish these st statistics the next time I get the data is at the 21st of March, I mean 21st of October, and I'm more than willing to provide them to you guys too. They're published, they're, 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 they're statistics for our investors, so. I, I, I should have elaborated a little bit more on what we did for the restaurants. Again, we worked very well with your economic development staff, and what we came up with is we allowed them to put their outdoor dining into required parking spaces. It generated, frankly, generated a little pushback from some of the neighbors, but we felt it was worth it to allow them to continue and get through. If we can just get through this COVID somehow, and I'm not sure what that means, um, but if we can get through it so that then they can open back up fully, then that's, I think that's our goal. Um, there's some interesting ideas. What happens when they start going 50%? Well, we haven't required any parking because they haven't had any indoor capacity. We think we're just gonna let the parking go for a while and, and take a relaxed approach on that and help out the businesses. Yeah. But again, that may be some pushback. If you live next door to one of these, maybe it's not your idea. We'll see. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Uh, next item on the agenda is our work plan. Michelle, you ready to go? Ready. Floor is yours. Sorry, just getting the presentation going. Um, thank you, commissioners. Um, I thought, and this is actually a good segue from our discussion, I thought I would fold my regular update that I do a little later in the meeting into this discussion about the work plan because I think it's important to reflect on what our accomplishments have been over the last year as we think about what we want to achieve in the next year. So I'll do a quick recap of 2019-2020 so we can then jump into the work plan discussion. Um, and just you know, a little bit of housekeeping. So a 2019-2020 work plan for this commission was actually not developed. Um, that kind of w happened during the time um, when I think there was a there was a staff vacancy. Tracy um, Bolin, the previous economic development manager, had retired, and so um, you know. But I think if when we look at the work plan, I'm sure you re have reviewed it. I think we'll agree that there are mostly, most everything is still relevant and we'll probably just need to make some updates. Um, so a recap of 2019-2020. Um, 2019 ended really strong. Um, some of the more notable economic development accomplishments and news from the second half of 2019 um, were that the economic development element of the general plan was approved thanks to input from this commission um, the staff vacancy was filled in this department with myself, the new manager. Um, we brought on a new commissioner, Ray Ream. Um, the Salt apartment complex that you're familiar with on Cleveland Street opened. By the way, I believe they're at, I think, full, full occupancy now. They have renters in all the units. Um, they brought a parking structure online, which has almost 400 new spaces for downtown and some commercial space. Um, the Measure X tax revenue, which was passed in the previous year, started to come in. Um, a 30-acre industrial site was purchased by a firm, um, that, and they're going to do some spec development. Um, Mission Square, right across from um, Oceanside High, was purchased by a, a new owner, and I think you've probably noticed if you've driven by that they've done some landscape improvements in the center. You know that was a you know a little bit rundown before is starting to look a lot nicer. Um, we launched the Higher Local Pilot Program, um, which you know, had been brought forward by um, our commission liaison, um, Council Member Rodriguez. Um, the downtown property improvement, pro downtown property business improvement, or PBID, um, was approved. And um, so that's going to bring you know, new cleaning and new ambassadors and things to um, improve downtown. The Hoot neighborhood uh, electric vehicle shuttle had a pilot program that was successful. And um, the Beach Resort won an award at the end of 2019 for the San Diego North EDC. Um, these are just a list of just a few of the businesses that opened um, in the second half of 2019. Um, we had 
you know, dozens of new businesses. We had several notable restaurants and wine and beer tasting rooms concentrated downtown. Um, I think it's safe to say that 2019 really continued the momentum of previous years when um, Oceanside was really starting to really get a, a food and beverage scene going. So then I'll just start off with the highlights of 2020. 2020 started off strong. Um, we had more notable restaurants open, several of which sort of expanded um, down Coast Highway, kind of increasing the footprint of, of downtown, like Pacific Coast Spirits, or excuse me, I, that was in late 2019, the Switchboard Restaurant and Bar. Um, we had a Krispy Kreme open, which like, I think Patty got like record, um, you know, social media <laughs> interest on the Krispy Kreme. Um, and then we had over 270,000 um, square feet of new industrial come online. The Scripps Healthcare is opening next week. We had UEI College. So a lot of activity um, at the beginning of this year. Um, and then, um, as Russ had mentioned earlier, a comprehensive general plan update has, had begun at the beginning of this year. Our beachfront improvement construction, um, we hired a new assistant city manager. And then March, COVID hit us. Um, so as Jeff had mentioned, we, we pivoted, we created a business loan program, we did grants through with our CARES Act funds through Main Street and the Chamber. Um, you know, we, we tried to just help our businesses survive as best we could with different resources and programs. Um, so, um, you know, I, I watched this economic forecast this morning from Dr. Chris Thornburg. He's, he's, a, he's a great economist um, with uh, Beacon Economics out of UC Riverside, and, and he said, we are learning to live with COVID. And I think, you know, we're starting to get comfortable wearing our masks and going out to dinner and restaurants are starting to get comfortable just operating in parking lots. And um, Dr. Thornburg said our economy will slowly bounce back. And, and I think Oceanside, you know, um, Commissioner Morris mentioned kind of nationally how things are going. But I think when you look at things a little more surgically, you know, just just on the other side of the 78 corridor, you have Escondido, which has a regional mall and an auto park. And then Oceanside sort of has, you know, we don't rely as heavily on sales tax revenue. And, and so, you know, I think you're sort of seeing these pockets of cities that are going to weather this well. Um, and I think Oceanside is uniquely positioned to be one of those cities. Um, you know, the sales tax that we have generated, and we haven't gotten the um, order in yet that was really kind of midst in the midst of COVID um, is from retailers like Target, like Walmart, like Home Depot, online sales, um, which have remained quite strong. Um, additionally, as um, Commissioner Gall knows, we are a drive market for tourism. Um, trip plans that might have included air travel maybe changed up and people came to Oceanside instead. Um, you know, Visit Oceanside has done a tremendous job, I think, of, of levering that, leveraging that message that we are open and showing lovely open beaches and lots of fresh air. And this, this has attracted people. Um, and our lifeguards say, even as of this morning, they're like, I think summer has extended into October. They're seeing just as many people because I guess, you know, if, you, if you're here from Arizona and you, you, know, you don't have to physically go to your office and your kids are doing school online, well, why not just stay at the beach, right? So that seems to be kind of what's happening. Um, so I'll conclude this recap of 2019-2020 with some things that are on the horizon, um, some of which Jeff mentioned. Um, we have shop local programs that Main Street and the Chamber are going to do this holiday season that we are helping fund with CARES Act money. Um, the Seabird Resort and the Mission Pacific Hotel, one of those projects that you know Jim referenced is 15 years in the making. Finally, we're going to see that, you know, happen next spring. Um, we have a, a cool boutique hotel that Tom Aldrich is doing um, adjacent to the former um, Fire Water that is now going to be a very classy cocktail lounge and uh, on Pier V Way. Um, the El Corazon Aquatic Center, Gilead and Kite Pharma are expanding next summer. Um, the 30-acre industrial site I mentioned um, is most likely going to be about half a million um, square feet of new industrial. Um, we mentioned the Blade Rooftop Lounge, 
Um, we are exploring an enhanced infrastructure finance district for El Corazon to fund the improvements to that. And then, um, as you had probably heard, I think it was maybe January, TE Connectivity announced that they were closing their Oceanside site. So that is, you know, ripe for redevelopment right there. Um, let's see. So, so that concludes the recap. And then um, I'll go ahead and go through the sections of the work plan. I'm going to go back there. And um, hopefully you've all sort of reviewed it, and then we can kind of make updates and kind of open the discussion. Does everyone have their work plan from the previous work, work plan? Um, I'll just kind of go through, I mean, I felt that the mission statement still reflected the, you know, the goals of, of this commission. Does anybody have any feedback or, or input about the mission statement needing to be updated? Okay. Um, composition is just kind of housekeeping. Obviously, um, Commissioner, Commissioner McFadden will be um, removed and Commissioner Sharp will be added um, in the, um, you know, commercial brokerage area. In number three, uh, goals and tasks, this also resonated, although a lot of this has been put on hold due to COVID. Um, so for example, instead of having manufac a manufacturing day event this month, we have manufacturing month and there are multiple virtual events. Same with startup week is now startup month and there's been multiple virtual events. But um, I think that once things are a little bit closer to quote unquote normal, you know, maybe beginning of next year. I think we, you know, doubling down on that participation in events and trade shows and conferences with our partners in the region is going to be even more important than ever. So if anybody has any input there in the business attraction and retention, let me know. But I think it, it, it's still pretty solid. Okay. Um, under strategic planning, um, the first bullet, which refers to um, the economic development element, you know, that's, that's done um, thanks to this commission. So I would propose that we update that to the comprehensive general plan update um, because now we're in the midst of that and I think it's going to be important that this commission encourages people to provide input and also, you know, is an advisory group to that GPU process. Does that sound okay? Um, the third bullet, I would propose that we very, get very specific now that the South Morrow Hills community plan is in progress and just, you know, change that to say we support, this commission supports the development of the South Morrow Hills community plan. Okay. Um, the uh, economic sustainability dashboard study um, is about two years old. So I would propose that we update that, and I'm happy obviously to take that on as staff, um, but that we still use that as a tool to communicate um, our message. And then El Corazon is very much still in play. You know, you heard some updates from Jeff. The Aquatic Center um, is slated to open next summer. Um, we had some stops and starts with a hotel project there, um, but it sounds like there is a developer doing some due diligence now. So, you know, I think COVID may have impacted just some progress there, but it's certainly still um, a, a big development opportunity in Oceanside. Um, they, the, the street naming is in progress now and, and will continue. Um, and the, as I mentioned, the enhanced infrastructure finance district um, feasibility study is in progress as well. So I hope that the commission, um, you know, still continues to stay kind of really plugged into the El Corazon development. And then lastly, with tourism and hospitality, again, for the first bullet, um, I think if we just update, update that to specifically re reference the South Morro Hills community plan, then it, you know, it still rings true. I think we should add a very, its own um, 
bullet about the new beachfront resort, um, just because I don't even know, and, and Commissioner Gall, maybe you can speak to this, I don't even know if we can wrap our brains around the impact that that's gonna have <laughs> to downtown Oceanside and to Ocean, greater Oceanside, um, just in, in many aspects. So I think, you know, focusing on that as a commission is, is probably an important part of our work plan. And I think we're gonna need to focus, because on our strategic plan, product development is a part of that. And for product development mm. for us, is like agritourism and creating diversity and sustainable tourism year round. And that is gonna be key for these beach resorts. And driving, mm. you know, focusing on those business sectors like the biotech and the medical, all of that to provide sustainable tourism, especially with this beach resort, is gonna be so important. I don't know how I can work with you on, on wording that, Yes, I think that needs to be specifically called out if others agree. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, I um, propose that we add a whole other section on COVID-19 um, business response. You know, um, we have kind of, you know, scrambled to implement programs and initiatives and pull together resources, um, and we will continue to do so, but, you know, as this continues and as it maybe doesn't just end all like one day you wake up and it's over it'll I think just be like kind of a slow trickle for you know quite a while I think um, it can't hurt to at least have this on our list for at least the next year and I'd like to know you know if you feel that that is worthwhile and that concludes my suggestions after reading through the work plan. Um, does anyone else have any updates or suggestions for updates? Any comments? You know, one of the things I think that's gonna be important also too for the city is, and as a whole, is bringing back that sunset market with mm -hmm. that because that was a whole viable area that brought in a, a, a unique group, families, it brought in a little bit of everything and, and not only that, it was beneficial to tourism in a lot of areas as far as because, of, especially those with the timeshares, it was a brand new crowd every week and those that were selling and retailing in it, it was a new crowd for them every week. It wasn't the same same group. So I think that's gonna be a big emphasis to the downtown area and to part of that tourism unit coming back to light again on that. Thank you. In the new hotel, is it? I'm not five thousand numbers. It's, it will accommodate five hundreds. Um, yeah. With breakout rooms. But, sorry, I, my salesperson can tell you the square footage. Commissioner Manley. I just have a comment on the business attraction and retention, and the third bullet working in partnership with the Oceanside Chamber to develop participate to get a pulse on local business. Um, one thing that I will say being um, the COO of a local business is that our resources are very thin right now. Things like chamber memberships and those kinds of things are probably one of the first things that we um, unfortunately have to let go of just to, to keep our business you know, going. And so as we're moving forward, checking the pulse of business, I would also recommend other ways to reach out to local community businesses other than the chamber. Um, I'm not sure what those avenues are, but I think you will get a far greater pulse with a, a, a much bigger reach if you expand beyond the chamber. Also, the another comment, which I'm not really sure where it would fit, is in, in the vein of shop local, um, I might suggest something along the lines of use local as well, not just shop. Shop, in, shop entails retail and that there's an actual product to sell, but um, you know, if we can encourage local businesses to use local business, mm -hmm. I think that we would be um, much better off as a community. I know for my business, you know, using promotional items and doing those kinds of things, I'm forever looking for hey, there's a lo local tchotchke shop, or there's a t-shirt printing shop, or there's this, or there's that, and, and as much as I would like the local restaurants to send me their injured workers, because that's what I do. So I think if we can build more collaborative relationships be beyond shop local, um, I think that could really enhance um, our development. Thank you, and you know, I'm glad you brought up the business walk bullet point, because 
um, you know, especially with COVID, you know, we've obviously pivoted to do a lot of things remotely. And while the business walk, um, because I've, I've done them in other cities, are a, it's a great exercise, but I think, you know, perhaps something a little more, like you're saying, like maybe an online survey or something where, you know, it's, it's not onerous on the business to respond and provide information and, and have that touch point, but um, it also can collect information, like you're talking about, how much B2B, you know, do you do and do you do it locally? And maybe we could like fold those two things in together, I don't know. Ward, your mic is not on. People can't hear you. Going through the process of doing business um, visitations was a phenomenal success. Um, so we need to kind of, for lack of a way, a better way of putting it, is to kind of think outside the box and how do we best approach um, these these businesses, and it was great because you you put a face to the name, you know Michelle's there and Patty's there to help you with any any problems that you have. The the idea is that you need to see who Michelle is, and and um, so I don't know what the answer is, um, but I think it, it has a profound influence when people walk through the door and know oh, that the people are from the city, mm -hmm. you know, they really get a, get a charge out of that. Um, I don't know where I'm going, but I think we need to think more creatively and ha rather than just a email or Thank a Zoom you. meeting. Thank yes. I mean, you, yes, a business walkthrough, you know, you know, I, you know, hire a millennial, we're probably all set, right? So a business walkthrough and a featured social media or something beyond that could be shared with the greater community of Oceanside, right? So I could provide a walkthrough of my own company if there was an incentive to do it where I knew it was going to be shared with local businesses who potentially might partner with me, I would feel really good about spending that time. Right. And it wouldn't cost me anything. It would cost me, you know, tell me how to do it. Give me a format. Is it, you know, a minute and 30 seconds? Is it, you know, whatever? And where am I uploading it to? And I can walk you through my business in a heartbeat. And I can also highlight the great people that are my staff that are members of this community and that are spending money in this community and raising their children in this community. So um, I agree, a, a more creative approach in a time that demands that, quite frankly, um, could really kind of set us on on the edge of, you know. And, and uh, more to your point, it shouldn't be just restaurants. It's gotta be or shop locally, or it should be something like you. We well, have a lot of services you that know? are right. used at the city. Yeah. I think from plumbers to you name it to exactly. whatever. I mean, bar somebody who repairs your barbecue. I mean, the, the, there's a lot of one person, two person people out there right. that are really going. Um, and and I've always been looking, even before trying to have you know u utilize people that are businesses that are local first before. I go out out of the area to have to to do it. Even sometimes, even it's a little bit more expensive. But I'd rather see that it's kept in, the community, in the community because yep. you're providing job, education, whatever thing else here. So yeah. maybe we could do something on that line of. It, it's going to take a while to put it together, obviously, to throw it. I mean, it's not an it's not an easy project. But maybe put it online, maybe with the city somehow. Maybe there's some type of a site. Maybe I don't know. Any membership, I would say. Right, so it's accessible to everybody because yeah, no, for a mom and no pop problem. plumber, you know, a chamber membership might not be feasible, but that doesn't mean it's it doesn't warrant being highlighted, right? So uh, uh, as a commission, I would say our job is to highlight Oceanside business and we need to find a really fun, creative way to do that. The timing is really good because 
since Main Street and the Chamber are using City CARES Act funds for these shop local campaigns, there is no um, option to do only membership. So right. this is good timing. They're going to do things citywide, and I think, like, I love these ideas. So yes, thank you. And for every business so far that, you know, would prefer not to be visited <laughs> by the city, there are at least five that would love it. So, you know, we've, even now with COVID, Patty and I don our masks and we'll <laughs> pop in <laughs> places. So I think um, we'll absolutely continue yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. Poor Krispy, Krispy Kreme. <laughs> um, there's no there there. That's the problem with that is Krispy Kreme. No, you know, first of all, who put it in front of the gym? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, because, and it's a good gym. It's a buff, it's a buff gym, you know, hardworking uh, workout people. Yeah, I'm going to grab a Krispy Kreme. Um, my, just let me finish my thought. Um, what is our current relationship with uh, North County Economic Development? San Diego North EDC. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are members, we're investors um, at the city level, which is kind of a discounted level um, other than you know businesses. Right. Um, the San Diego North EDC has, I think in the last two years really come up. Um, they're providing, especially in kind of the data and research side of things, um, They because their new executive director is a, kind of a, you know, a, a data guy, a research guy. Um, so that's, I, I think that that organization has really um, shown value in the last couple of years. We have a good partnership with them. Could you arrange to get a presentation from them? I'm sure um, they I would don't be think happy we've to. had them in here for a year and a half. Absolutely. So I was just going to say, is there a, you said, is there a, a website or something associated with, because people go online to look at things. So when you, we, whomever goes, we need to be filming ourselves and putting it on there because that's how people are shopping and looking for things. My business is obviously marketing. I know I'm in real estate, but it's all about marketing. Um, but that's really fun. And we don't have to worry about how we look and all that kind of stuff because it's like um, if you see somebody going to like a new restaurant, which we always try and eat local as well and stuff. We don't eat out a lot, and I never eat donuts. I apologize. <laughs> I will never darken the doors. Anyway. Not, <laughs> um, but it's kind of nice if somebody's already been, so you're familiar maybe, and then if, I don't know if we have somebody there who represents whatever that business is, and you go, oh, I remember you. I saw you online. This yeah. is how people are anymore. I mean, it's just the way it is. I. I kind of have a love-hate. I'm good with it. So. I think part of our role as commissioners... <laughs> I think part of our role as commissioners is to be liaison, liaisons to yeah. the community at large. Um, I have business cards from the EDC card. I think we all should have those. Um, so when we go into a local restaurant or a business, we have it there and say, hey, you know, I'm a member of the economic development for the city. And if you ever need anything, here's my card. Or how and can we highlight how you? How can we, you know, uh, you know, seriously, this is what we do and we want to interface with businesses and help grow your audience, what have you. And people really respond, you know, very favor favorably because they think that they really have somebody who can hold their hands. And you guys are more than capable to do that. And I used to call Tracy and say, hey, listen, Joe, Joe Schmuckatelli over here needs, needs some hand-holding. He's got a problem with, you know, uh, this the desk down at, uh, at downstairs, you know, is, and it's it's a good way to get people active. And I will say that um, you know so throughout a lot of these documents, there's this continuous theme of a partnership with Miracosta College, and I, I just think that the utilization of student talent 
cannot be underestimated, um, perhaps in photography and video. And I will tell you, just on a very personal note, my son went through the TCI drone program, and those kids are always looking for opportunities to promote their skill set so that they have a portfolio to, to, to show to future employers particularly when it comes to drone shots, right? So mm -hmm. we can, I think we can leverage that relationship that we have built into the city by virtue of Miracosta. And I know with Al certainly being on the vice chair, I think we have an in yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I certainly think that we have a lot of unexplored opportunity. I know just with the drone kids, we've used them for great shots of our company and made little video blurbs, you know, a minute long. Um, and they're happy to do it because, again, it builds a portfolio and tells it tells, you know, the local community. Number one, we're good at what we do because we were trained. And number two, look what we could do for your company. This is a new approach to a look at, you know, you know an overhead shot versus just your sterile, you know, front of the building shot and stuff like that. So I think we could be creative with free talent. To your point, bring them in, you know. Yes, awesome. Thank you. Always looking for free talent. You could continue your series original at works, the videos you did by doing smaller videos, highlighting individuals, and keep that content going out mm. um, continuously and sponsor it. You know, feed the beast. You do one video, and it's a week later, you got to do another one. I just, if no one else has anything to say, I did want to bring up something as it relates to business attraction. I know we talked in the past about the importance of action sports and that being an opportunity, especially since it's such a good brand fit for Oceanside's personality and looking at manufacturing with action sports. And I don't know if we work with San Diego Sport Innovators. I think you actually, maybe Michelle, you introduced me to him at one point. Or maybe vice versa. I introduced you to anyway. COVID, COVID brain, everything kind of went <laughs> fizzled out after that. But anyway, it might be an opportunity to regroup with them um, because Say they the name again. Of, Sorry, Can, San Diego Sport Innovators. Okay, thank you. Because um, I still feel think I still feel like that's a great niche for us. Um, that's that's something viable right now um, with other industries not so viable. And then um, as it relates to infrastructure, not just beautification, but we also talked about creating infrastructure to be attractive to biotech and maybe um, providing like brine lines and things like that. So if they're in place then there's not that extra expense for them and it would draw more of those types of businesses um, that I think would be important. Again, creating that diversity that we need. Thank you. Yeah, and it's there, but just. Anyone else? Um, as I mentioned, I will take these comments and put them into a work plan to be approved at the December meeting. All right, um, well, if there's anything else from Michelle, we're gonna move on. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, commissioner updates, um, it's that part of the program. I don't have much by way of an update other than I'm hoping all of you and your families are remaining safe and sound during the COVID pandemic, uh, and then we can pick it up as necessary. Let's start with anyone else on the phone. Well said, Commissioner Matthews, uh, Chair Matthews, and I wish everyone the same. And uh, Work-based learning is big, so anything I can do to connect with what was mentioned regarding st connecting students to work. If you were willing to provide an internship, for example, we've quadrupled our internships in the last year and a half or so. So um, I, 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 I'll connect whoever needs an intern or just a day's worth of work from a student who's looking for experience anytime. Anybody else on the phone? All right, let's start with those of you in chambers. Well, uh, I, I really have nothing, but I'll go ahead and welcome uh, the commissioners. Uh, you've been here once before. A couple times. Oh, really? Yeah. And Thank you for being here and, and providing service. Um, 
I have nothing else. Um, that's been it. I have I think a it's brief just, It's just nice to be out and about. <laughs> <laughs> No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to give a brief tourism update if anybody's interested. Um, as, as Michelle and um, David kind of highlighted, um, Oceanside is situated where we are well positioned, really. It has been devastating to our community. But when we compare it to other beach destinations, we're doing better. Our occupancy, we ended in August at 67%. For other beach, um, Southern California beach destinations, they were around 55%. Our occupancy in ADR is higher than Carlsbad, and our occupancy is higher than San Diego right now. Wow. Um, it's those urban areas that are really hurting, so we are fortunate to be a smaller beach community, lots of wide open space, lots of outdoor recreation, and that's what we're really highlighting and, and focusing on and being really thoughtful in how we um, share that information. So there is um, some silver lining there. I am really worried about going into fall and winter um, where we lost a lot of our citywide events that our industry relies on. Um, we're working really hard advocating with our governor right now as an industry to really bring back the attractions, some of the small meetings and sporting events. Um, all the states around us have opened up at some level with those activities, and we're experiencing a lot of leakage um, leaving California. Um, there was even a news story that our, yoke, our local youth who used to go down the road and play sports are leaving and going to Arizona and Utah to play those games because they're allowed to play there. So those states are also getting room night generation, not only from big events, but also youth sports events that aren't happening here. So we're just really working hard. It's just hard to see all that leave. And, um, and again, just kind of nervous about what fall and winter looks like. We know how much our small businesses rely on that. Um, even through the summer, I think it was really um, prevalent in, in that we were really busy on the weekends, but midweek we really suffered and, and our small businesses were suffering from that as well. Um, our group sales are continuing to work really hard though into the future. We do have proposals out on citywide events for 22 and 23, so that's kind of encouraging. We're already talking about um, the, um, the El Corazon Aqua Center and as part of that, uh, as and those are a part of our proposal, so that's pretty exciting. And then of, with the beach resorts coming online, that's opened up a whole new world to us as well. So, yeah, and they do, um, their team is incredible, very collaborative, very excited to be a part of the community. They re announced their names this week. I don't know if you guys saw that, um, but the um, boutique property is Mission Pacific hotel, and then the resort is sea, the Seabird Resort. So I don't know if you saw that, but check them online. Um, you can follow them. And then my last thing is the Oceanside Culture Fest is this weekend. That was something that was born out of the um, Oceanside California Cultural District. Um, so that's exciting. So please look online for that. We've got some great musicians and entertainment, again, pivoting to make something um, happen since we weren't able to actually have an event um, live and in person. So please check that out. We will, they, we will be debuting um, a signature song that the Arts Commission commissioned local Shane Hall to produce for us. And so that video will air on Saturday too. So check it out. That's it, if you, unless you have any questions. I'll give an update. Um, just as a resource to the business community, um, Work Partners, which is the company I operate, um, we've been able to source a rapid COVID test. So if you have employees that you want tested, um, or if we can be a resource to any business out there, it's a 95% accurate nasal swab. You can I can fill you with a bunch of literature. And if you don't like that, we also have the PCR swab. So our company in general is doing a ton of COVID work for local employers, uh, making sure that their workforces are safe. And I would add on top of that that I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it's going into flu season. So I encourage all employers out there to uh, offer flu clinics for their companies. Um, and if there's any questions or any education or anything we can provide as a company to the local business community about how to hopefully protect your, your workers or what to do if, what to do when my employee gets the sniffles, um, those kinds of things, that's what we're really good at. So we're happy to help the community at large and I'm happy to answer any individual questions if they 
are come up. I just have one other thing to add. Um, please, uh, if you find people that are um, hardship and they have um, banking needs, you know, hardship didn't have to start on March 20. 20th when we went into lockdown. The hardship may be starting now, but if it's COVID related, under the CARES Act, you can go to your bank and you can get uh, some type of deferment up through two months after the um, national emergency has been declared resolved or done. So most, most banks are going to ask, only give you a three-month deferral, and they'll ask you questions. And if you're a business, they'll ask you for financials and stuff like that. But most businesses, most banks, will continue on with a deferment until it comes to a point that the borrower and the bank, the borrower wants to throw in the towel and, and so forth. It is the only time in my lifetime that the federal government has ever done this. Because I want to tell you something. The federal, the, what typically happens is the federal government tells us to foreclose. Take that business back, that piece of property back. Take that homeowner, get that resident back. This is the first time ever in my life that the regulators and the government have said, work with the public. And um, hopefully, it will stay that way for the next six months because, it's, you know, as Michelle said, every economist that I've listened to says the same thing. We're learning to live with COVID. And, uh, you know, I've been to work since April 15th and go in every day. And a lot of us are the same way, but there's a lot of people who are not. So um, we're learning to live with COVID and we're going to restaurants, we're going out, we're seeing we are supporting our local restaurants here and, and, and so forth, and more and more people are doing that. So that's, a, that's, that's the silver lining in all of this mess. It really is. All right, any additional updates? Hearing none, I believe that concludes our agenda. Michelle, you talked about your, gave your update during your presentation, correct? Correct. All right. So uh, with that, we are adjourned to our next meeting on December 15 at 3 p.m. Uh, I hope and pray that everyone remains safe and sound until then, and we'll, we'll touch base then, guys. Be safe. Thanks, Likewise. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.